next we have a fireside chat with Rachmani Banerjai, the CEO of Pratham Education Foundation and a global leader in the field of education. Rachmani's work at Pratham has revolutionized education in India by focusing on foundational literacy and numeracy skills that are crucial for children's success. But we're not just here to talk about education policy and the challenges of, of implementing effective teaching practices. We want to get to know the person behind the visionary ideas and hear about Rachmani's journey to becoming a leader in social impact. So please welcome to the stage Rachmani Banerjai and Anjali Reina, the Executive Director of Harvard Business School India Research Center. Hello, everybody, and uh, hello, Rukmini. This is a very, very special time for me because uh, I've been tracking Rukmini for the last number of years. Rukmini, as everybody knows, is a wonderful scholar, one of those products of that ivory tower that was just being talked about. She's been at the best schools in Delhi, St. Uh, St. Stephen's, Delhi School of Economics, a Rhodes Scholar, done her PhD from the University of Chicago. But apart from her academic credentials, Rukmini's work in research and development are legendary. In fact, she was just honored in 2021 with the Yidan, have I pronounced that correctly? Yidan Prize for Research and Development in Education. Rukmini's work in research and development at Pratham and her leadership of Pratham was what actually helped her to coin the word learning outcomes. Both yesterday and today, everybody's been talking about learning outcomes. That was a phrase that Rukmini developed. And everybody's measuring it now. One of the ways in which learning outcomes was measured was through the Asar report. And that was the first thing that I wrote about when we did the case study. We've been tracking Pratham through the case studies, the Harvard Business School case studies, which is where I work. The first case study we wrote in 2010, and the other case study we wrote more recently, because Pratham is a classic in an organization which has done great work in this space. So Asad was one of the first things, the Asad report was one of the first things we wrote about in our case study. And for the last month when I've been trying to get time with you, Rukmini, you've been busy with the Asad report, and the Asad report has finally just been released. So you've been doing learning, out everybody is talking about learning outcomes, the Asad report is out. During COVID, everybody knows that the learning outcomes were bad. Why are you doing the report again? What's the challenge? Everybody knows, is there any point in repeating the report again and again? And what's the opportunity or challenge that faces the learning space for K-12? Um, Anjali, great to be here. <clears throat> I looked through the uh, schedule and I found that uh, uh, in fireside chats, I think we are the only one which has two women on it, so we need a big clap, <laughs> louder. <laughs> I also love the idea of doing a fireside chat when it's 28 degrees outside. <laughs> but that aside, we will use our time well. So this is a question that we are asked a lot. The Asad report has been done from 2005. You know, I have lost count myself of whether this is the 17th or the 20th report. But if you look at what we are measuring, and in 2005 it was an early measurement of can children read or do basic math in India, uh, and uh, the question, I think, still remains uh, very, very valid. My own kids who have grown up with Asar say, if the report is the same, why don't you just change the cover and bring the same thing out every year? But it is an important thing that for a country with 250 million children, if we are not achieving basic reading, basic arithmetic at the right time, in the first couple of years in school, then whether it is an ivory tower or the Lego way of building it, none of this is going to be possible. So our Asar 2022 report came out a month ago, and it was done after four years. And we had two years of COVID in between, in which there was a lot of worry about what it is doing to the education system, what is it doing to the young children, and so on. 
And I'm really happy that I think the uh, report has gotten you know, more attention than ever before. And I attribute some of that attention to the fact that in this period, the government came up with a new education policy with a very clearly articulated goal. And the goal is exactly what we've been waiting for for 20 years or more, which is to say that India needs to achieve for every child basic reading, foundational literacy and numeracy by the time they get to grade three. Now remember, we have 25 million children in each age group in India. So over a period of the next five years, we need to go from where we are today, which is roughly around the 20, 25 percent uh, children in grade three who are able to do this to 100 percent. It's a huge jump and a huge jump that I think that we as people of India should be absolutely poised to take. Government is doing many things, but I see not very many people in this room, so I'm not sure who I'm talking to. But I think that this is very important. There's a huge opportunity in it for people like those who are attending this conference, because this foundational literacy and numeracy goal is India's top priority. And to be able to contribute solidly in that top priority, I think is something that is going to be good for the country and potentially good for people who participate as well. So the ASA report has to be done. We have to look at whether our temperature is getting better. And we, I at least feel now is the time when if all efforts are put together, we should be able to achieve this goal and achieve it well. So Rukmini, you know, this bunch, people who are here are all investors or entrepreneurs. And they go by market opportunity. You were telling me about the market opportunity, the 250 million children and so on and so forth, and the money that's available. So if I look at at least, uh, I'm not a technology person, but if I look at who is being served in this market, uh, I would roughly guess it's maybe no more than 40 million. Those who are close to exam taking, those who are uh, keen on uh, getting good marks, uh, and these are all at a certain end of the education uh, ivory tower, actually. Uh, I see 200 million who are not being served necessarily by uh, the new technologies that could do that. And I think that if you look at how much parents are spending, you have almost 30% of kids in India, our report is a rural report, parents who send their children for some kind of a paid class outside of normal school, whether private or government, we have anywhere, depending on the year, 30% of children who are going to private school. So you may be having private school plus tuition, you may be having government school plus tuition. And I think the COVID period showed everybody that while parents, especially in rural areas, especially from disadvantaged backgrounds, parents actually began to engage in learning. I was telling Anjali about the fact that uh, during the pandemic, during the lockdown, we were directly connected to almost 10,000 villages and about 30, 300,000 families. And what we could use was not any of the high tech that we talk about, but we used SMS. And in the SMS, an SMS would go every day, little, little bits of activities, and we would follow up that with a phone call every week or every 10 days. Now, we are quite well known for a method called teaching at the right level which helps kids gain basic literacy and numeracy quickly. But what we learned during COVID was how do you do reaching at the right level with parents? Because when we did that, our own content, even if the content was a 160 character content, improved tremendously. So I am fully, fully of the belief that parents in India are ready, but they need to be reached at the right level. They need to be engaged in a way that they feel that they can participate. And surely, if that is 200 million children, that is presumably most will have two parents. It's a lot of people who are waiting to be served and served with the right dish, for which I think there will be willingness to engage and to pay. Thank you. That's really a positive way of looking at it, that there is a market opportunity. There is money available. There is parent engagement. And if we reach them at the right level, we can make a difference. That's good to hear. Okay, so something new, just switching tracks a bit. When you started Pratham over 20 years ago, nobody worked with the government. Working with governments, especially government here, has its challenges because you have to be a partner. You cannot have full control. So what made you go with this partnership route to partner with the government? 
So, I mean, the, you know, the government uh, has, uh, you know, vast scale. And in the end, I think any good idea that you have, if it can be embedded in that system and produce impacts that are significant, then that's the really reason that you're in the game. So we work by having some direct laboratories, 10,000, 20,000 villages, at whatever time uh, resources are available, to come up with what kinds of solutions will work in different contexts. But the reason we are doing that is we want to then transplant these into much larger systems and see how you can catalyze it. So if I would say as Pratham, if we've learned anything about working with millions of children, we have learned it all from the government. Because government systems exist, there is a lot of human resources in the government systems. I think the task of an Indian citizen is to catalyze what we do within the government uh, uh, structure so that the impact can be much larger. I'll give you an example. For the national, new national education policy, which puts out this foundational stage, age three to age eight, it's a new thing to have age three to six as part of our foundational uh, group and part of our national policy. A large part of the three to six today in India is in the Anganwadis, the government-run early childhood centers. Now, there are things that we have done in our own programs that we think should be scaled up. One of them is making groups of mothers by their neighborhood and doing activities with these mothers that actually help mothers understand the importance of the breadth of skills and of the progression and the continuum that is needed in this age group. We've been doing this, as I said, with let's say 10,000 villages. The government of Maharashtra felt this was an important enough initiative to institute it in all their schools. So from a 10,000, you're going to every single school, government school in Maharashtra, and we see the momentum and the energy and the enthusiasm, and the two-way learning multiply many-fold. So why would anybody not work with the government? <laughs> and I'll tell you, some of the most exciting governments to work with are the governments from my part of the country. I'm from Bihar. We've worked a lot with Bihar government, neighbor UP. I think large programs are happening in UP. And if Bihar and UP are able to improve learning levels, and by the way, the Asar report shows three states where learning levels in 2022 are not lower than that uh, in 18. It is actually two of those states are Bihar and UP. So uh, finally, somebody <laughs> clapped. <Okay. laughs> so investing in where there is a lot of room to grow, I think, is the place to be. It's a good place to be. Would you like to talk about the Delhi government as well? Yes, yes, of course. I mean, Delhi government has a thousand schools. So, you know, in the face of UP, which has 120,000 schools, it's a small number. But I think that the Delhi government is a very good example of how they've tried a whole series of interconnected reforms. Things that make teachers feel motivated, bringing parents along board, and really thinking about uh, children as well. Uh, many things, we don't have time to talk about all the things, but I would say that one of the remarkable things they did after schools opened in July, in uh, April last year, was they put their curriculum aside because they realized that the basic foundation of learning had been eroded. Some of it was easy to rebuild and some of it had to be built in the first place. So from almost April till August, throughout their sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth grades, they put the grade level curriculum aside, worked on basic foundations, and I was telling Anjali with some numbers that let's say a school that I visited regularly had 900 kids in this sixth to ninth age group. Uh, they had 600 kids at the beginning in April that were struggling with reading textbooks at a fifth standard level. Uh, by middle of August, this number was down to 62. And that 62 needed all kinds of other efforts. But if you hadn't tried to bring in this basic for all, you would have lost those 62 in this bigger mess. Uh, so I would say that Delhi government has done many things, but certainly being focused on building the basics for all as a very high priority is something that they need to be applauded for. Okay, so you, we've been talking a lot about junior, you know, primary education, and you were earlier focused on the K-12 segment. Now Pratham is talking about skilling and employability. Why? And you have to make this short because I want to get to my last question as well. Okay. okay. So very simple. Uh, if you look at the age group 14 to 18, it's a very interesting age group. Compulsory schooling is done. You cannot be placed in the organized sector till you're 18. 100 million 
at least in this age group. Uh, I want to just quickly refer to a uh, Asser survey that we did in 2017, which looked at four things for this age group. One was, what are they doing today? What activity are they doing today? 85% uh, were enrolled in an educational institution, and 40% were already working, usually with their family. Did they want to be studying? Not sure. Did they want to be working? Definitely not. But that's what they were doing. What did they want to do? What was their aspirations? Very high aspirations, not only their own, but their families, many of these children were the first of their families to reach eighth grade. So high aspirations, your own, your father's, your grandmother's, everybody's aspirations on your shoulders. Awareness, how do you get from here to where you want to be? Very little knowledge. And finally, if you look at the projections of the Asar report, even in eighth grade, there is a lot, almost 50% who are struggling with basic arithmetic, 25% who can't read. Now, given this complete misalignment of 100 million of our immediate future, I think everybody needs to look at this age group. And so we are doing our bit in terms of thinking about what is the life pathway that these kids need. It's not about just education. It's not just about marks. How do you prepare kids to learn for life? And then, of course, to learn for school and learn for work. But what you want to get ready for is learning for life and livelihoods. Okay, so that sort of leads into my next question, which is, I've heard you say that technology, and I hope I don't get lynched in this room, instead of liberating the learning process, is a slave to the age-grade linear road learning system in schools. Should I repeat that again? Technology, instead of liberating the learning process, is a slave to the age-grade linear road learning system in schools. Rukmini, can you explain this? And tell me why you think technology is a slave in no, schools. So I would say the way it is used in India today fits that description. It doesn't have to be. It could be a hugely liberating force. It could be the biggest non-linear uh, you know, direction that you could have. But open any newspaper in India today, first page, second page is all about exam performance. If you have bought into some kind of a coaching, some kind of a... I mean, you know, all kinds of ways in which you can improve your exam performance at different levels of exams. Now, this is, I think, what uh, Professor Agarwal was talking about, the top of that ivory tower, which is making sure that all the way to the bottom, you're only looking at the top and never looking out of the window in any direction. And this age-grade linearity within our education system is what I feel is leaving lots of kids behind. Our current data shows that by grade three, 75% of the kids have already been left behind. And that's why, because you are following a curriculum that is pegged at the level of somebody else and not of every child in your class. So again, examples from many states who have done this catch-up programs, who have done putting aside the curriculum, you see very quick progress when you start with kids at the level at which they are, and then are able to motivate them to go towards the level at which they want to be. But we begin with curriculum, and we don't begin with children. <laughs> and I think for any kind of learning process, you've got to begin with where you are today, regardless of age, and move forward. Thank you. So we've done well as the only women fireside chat. We have time for one question. We have time for one question from the audience. Anybody with a question? Seema Biswas. Yes, okay, Shweta. a tough job just to show up and keep going when there's so many challenges on a day-to-day -day basis. So what, what sort of motivates you? What keeps that smile, that positivity? Um, because ultimately as a founder, as an entrepreneur, you, your energy passes on to your team, right? So where do you get that inspiration? I'm not a founder, so you know, hats off to founders. I'm just a follower. But I would say we work with a large number of young people 
And I find it very energizing when local youth are actually feel like they can change the destiny of their own community or on their own village. And the way they do it, and I think that this business about children and learning is very infectious. Because if you, as I said, start at the right level with the kids, they show progress. And any progress that a child shows is very infectious. It infects the instructor, it infects the parents, it makes everybody feel that a lot is possible. And I think for 20, 25 years that I've done this, the big numbers sometimes can look depressing, but the everyday work that we do is highly energizing. Because you can see that very simple things can lead to big progress. We need people like you in the education <laughs> system. Thank you for the work that you do. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Anjali. Thank you, Rukmani. Uh, it says here we have an announcement from Elsa. So let's see it. 